I was praying this week, asking the Lord, okay, what do you want me to preach? What is it um, that you want me to direct your people into your word? And I felt God bring conviction on my own heart. Because there has been something that has actually been missing in my own quiet time with the Lord that I believe is very crucial in order to hear and feel the presence of God. And so the subject I want to talk about today is worship. I want to talk about worship. I want to talk about the presence of the Lord changing your life, that you're able to receive a word from him and know that he loves you, know that he is real, and know that he is in your situation. Because I realize a lot of us do not worship at home right? A lot of us don't. When we have our quiet time, we may pray and read, but we don't just take the time to worship and praise him for what he has done in our life. And so today I'm excited because I'm going to show you a revelation today. I believe that could change your life out of the word of God. So let's start. All right. So I'm going to call this point A, but point A, let me show you this. The word of God tells us that when you come into his presence, you need to sing praises to his holy name. Okay, when you come into the presence of God, you sing praises to his holy name. Psalm chapter 95, verse 1 and 2. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with what? With thanksgiving, and let us sing psalms of praise to him. So when you come into the presence of God, you sing praises to his holy name. Thank you, God, that you have saved me today. Thank you, God, for the blessings that I have today that I don't even know about, because we're all blessed just to be here today, just to have your health or your family or the things that we take for granted. God is reminding us of the things to be thankful for, and we get to declare his name because of it. But the second point is this. Point B, don't miss this. This is big. When you worship the presence of the Lord, God will manifest his presence around you. And I'm going to show you this out of scripture. This is really cool. But when you come into the presence of God and you worship him with all of your heart, soul, and mind, God will manifest his presence around you. Psalm chapter 100, verse 4. I love this. Don't miss it. Enter into his gates with what? So how do you enter into the gates of God, the presence of God? You enter it with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his holy name. So when you're in the presence of God, it is by giving him praise and being thankful that you're able to hear and receive a word from the Lord. Please don't miss that. I'm going to show you today that when you worship the Lord, God is actually preparing your heart to receive a word from him that can not only change your life, but save your life. Let me show you one example. In 2 Kings chapter 3, the king of Israel knows that the Moabites are coming against him. So the king of Moab wants to take him out, destroy the land, take everybody under uh, captivity, okay, and take out the king of Israel. And he knows that he cannot beat them alone. So he, he suggests, I need some help. And he goes to the king of Judah and the king of Edom. And he goes to them and tells them, hey, will you help me fight this battle? Will you go into battle with me so that everybody can be protected and that we're all good? Now, just to give you some context or the background, the king of Israel was not a God-fearing man. He did not fear the Lord. He did not really serve the Lord as he should. But the king of Judah did. And the king of Judah told him, listen, before we go and make this fight or before we go fight this battle, we need to receive a word from the Lord. We need to know that the Lord is on our side before we go out and do something and risk our own life. Now, I want you to think about that. How many times do you do that? When a situation is happening, maybe it's at work or with your family or there's conflict in your life, how many times do we just rush into a situation believing we have all the right answers without asking God's advice? or direction, okay? And I'm telling you, not only will God save your relationships, he could also save your life. And so the, uh, the king of Judah tells them, says, okay, do you not know a prophet that hears from the Lord? I said, yes, this prophet is Elijah. Now, what's funny to me about Elijah is that he did not like the king of Israel. He actually told him to his face, listen, if it was just you, I would not give you a word from the Lord, okay? But because of the king of Judah, he was going to save them and share with them the word of the Lord. Now, don't miss this. In 2 Kings chapter 3, verses 15 through 18, Elijah asked for something very specific in order to hear from God. Here's what he did. 
That's what he did. He said, now bring me someone who can play the harp. And while the harp was being played, the power of the Lord came upon Elijah. And he said, this is what the Lord says. This dry valley will be filled with pools of water. Okay. You will neither see wind nor rain, says the Lord, but this valley will be filled with water. You will have plenty for yourselves and your cattle and other animals. But this is only a simple thing for the Lord. Don't miss this. For he will make you victorious over the army of Moab. So now they're not afraid. Now they're prepared to fight. Why? Because they heard directly from the Lord that God was going to fight this battle. And if you, were la- if you were here last week, I taught you how to hear clearly from the Lord, how to know what's God speaking to you over your own thoughts. But do not miss how Elijah prepared the space to hear from God. What did he do? He said, I need somebody to come in and play music, play a harp. We're going to worship the Lord so that we can hear from God. All right? So think about this. When you come to church, you automatically expect three things. The first thing you expect is worship. You come in here, you expect to worship the Lord, and that's all I ever hear. How's the worship? Do you like the worship there? Is the worship loud? Is it, is it subtle? Is it good? Do you like it? Do you move around? Like, what, how do you worship, right? Because what happens? When you come in here, even if you failed or messed up this week, or if you have burdens on you, okay, or if good things have happened and you just want to come into the presence of God and shout praise to him, when you worship, God prepares your heart to receive a word. You realize that? Because he takes your burdens away. And we talked about that last week too. When you pray, one of the first things you should pray is for God to take away your burdens because they're distractions, Okay, maybe it's a financial burden. Maybe it's a relationship burden. Maybe it's family drama. I don't know. But give it over to the Lord. And then we start worshiping and praising his holy name, believing he's going to perform a miracle even before we see a miracle. So when we worship, we prepare our hearts to receive from the Lord. And then when I preach, you're able to receive. You understand? Because you're mentally prepared. Your heart is ready to hear from the Lord. And then at the end, what do we do? We pray, and we pray for healing. We pray for repentance. We pray that God shows up in our life and shows us how good he is because we want something deeper. But listen to me, it all starts with what? Worship. And so this convicted me because so many times I feel like maybe I'm rushing trying to read his word and pray real quick. God, thank you, Lord, so much for this word. It's so good today. Thank you very much. Okay, I got a lot to do. See you later. We do that a lot. And so when you worship, you're actually making yourself sit down and not be distracted with life. God, I'm going to praise you, and I'm not leaving until I hear a word from you. And according to this story in 2 Kings chapter 3, Elijah had to hear this word for their life to be saved, to know that this battle was going to be won. Okay, so here's an important truth. Worship prepares our hearts to be right with God. Worship prepares our hearts to be right with God in order to hear from the Lord, all right? So the title of today's message is this, how to enter into the presence of God, how to truly enter into the presence of the Lord and know that he is there and know that he is in your situation. And so I want to give you another revelation too before we start, okay? Before I share some things that you can apply to your life, I want you to understand, and I've said this before, since the beginning of time, all the way to the end of time, The Bible tells us that there is a spiritual battle taking place over one specific subject, who you worship. Do you realize that? From the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation, the battle around us, the reason the world is pulling at you all the time is because Satan wants you worship, but God knows that you were created in his image to give glory to him, to be set free. But the battle from the beginning all the way to the end is all about who do you worship. So my question is, why? Why is this the battle that we face in everything that we do and everything that we decide? We have to go back to the beginning, okay? And in the beginning, we know that Satan was created in heaven as an angelic being. He was a cherubim. Now, what's funny is that if you look up cherubims today in our culture, you would see a fat baby with wings, That is not Satan, okay? 
Um, this is a huge angelic being, very powerful, and I'm going to prove it to you. So in Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 13 through 15, uh, we get a little bit of a description here. It says, you were in Eden, the garden of God. Your clothing was adorned with every precious stone. Let's skip to verse 14 here. I ordained and anointed you as a mighty angelic guardian, okay? In Hebrew, this word guardian actually means cherubim. So in a lot of your translations, you may see cherub right here. It says, you had access to the holy mountain of God and walked among the stones of fire. Now listen to this. You were blameless in all you did from the day you were created until the day evil was found in you. I need you to understand that everything God creates in the very beginning, everything God creates, everything that he puts together is beautiful and perfect. The very beginning, Adam and Eve. Sometimes the conversation me and my wife have is, I wonder how beautiful they were. Think about it. Because everything God creates is just amazing and beautiful. And we know according to the word of God that even Satan himself was created Beautifully, He was a beautiful, angelic being. In fact, the word of God tells us that he, he got struck with vanity, and that's the reason he wanted to be worshipped. He wanted everybody else to worship him, and some scholars believe that he may have led worship in heaven. So as he got a little taste of this, he wanted more. And so why did Satan fall? We see this answer out of Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah 14, 12 through 14. How you have fallen from heaven. O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you are cut down to the ground, you who have weakened the nations, for you have said in your heart, now listen to what Satan said about himself, he said, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. Everything Satan said about himself was to exalt his name, his throne, above the throne of God, meaning he wanted everybody to worship him. So the battle began because of worship. And then from the beginning to the end is all about who do you worship? But I love this because God said, no, 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 no. Your throne will never be exalted over my throne. In fact, your throne will be sent down to the lowest pit of hell, the lowest of low. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 15. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. This is why the battle is over who do you worship. It started in heaven. It's been brought down upon this earth, and we are tempted every day on what we're praising. Do you understand? And I, I, I started thinking about this because, man, it gave me a revelation. Like, goodness, every day we fight this battle. We fight this battle with our own flesh. We compete with everybody we meet, right? Let me just prove it to you. If you meet somebody or start to talk to, to somebody who's sharing good news about their life, what do we do? Automatically, and C.S. Lewis talks about this, a lot of times in our own mind, we start comparing what they're saying with our own life, okay? So if they're sharing something good about them, we're automatically thinking about something good we're going to share in the conversation, right? Oh, that happened for you. Hey, guess what happened for me? I know, crazy, right? We automatically turn the conversation on ourselves. So this is something that God has worked on my heart, and I want to encourage you with today. When somebody is talking about them, be very selfless and just enjoy what God is doing for them. Don't talk about yourself. Don't. (laughs) Don't talk about yourself. Allow them to share with you the good that is happening in their life and be joyful for what's taking place. But don't talk about yourself. And it's very hard though. Let's be honest. It is very hard when somebody shares their goals. Let me share another example for you. Um, One pastor said it like this. When you take a group picture and you do not like how you look in that picture, (laughs) automatically automatically you're going to say, that's not a good picture. Mm -mm. You look awful. You look awful. Let's take another one. I think somebody blinked in there. Nobody blinked. Yeah, somebody blinked. Okay, let's take another picture. And if you like how you look in that picture, that's a great group picture, (laughs) right? We're going to post that on Facebook. We're going to frame it, whatever, right? Because we automatically look at ourselves. But here's, here's the good news. The Spirit of God living inside of us fights our flesh. And so a lot of times when you're about to talk about yourself or you want to compete, the Spirit of God says, 
No. There's a ministry happening here. If you talk about yourself, you're going to mess it up. They need to know the love of God. They need to know that God can do something in their life, and God may use you in that situation when you stop thinking about yourself and what they're actually telling you in the moment. But it can be very hard to do. And the truth is, Jesus also said it like this. He said, listen, if you live to praise yourself above everybody else, be careful, because eventually you're going to be humbled. And you could even be brought down to the lowest of low. Luke chapter 18, verse 14, Jesus said this to the Pharisees. He says, I tell you, the sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, I love Proverbs chapter 30, verse 32, because it states it like this. If you have been foolish and exalting yourself, or if you have devised evil, go ahead and put your hand on your mouth. Stop talking. Stop bragging about yourself. Because here's a hard question I really want you to think about. Do you live to praise God, or do you live to praise yourself? And the way that you know is think about the conversations you just had this week. Who did you talk more about? Did you talk more about what the Lord is doing in your life, what God has done for you? Or have you always been the main subject of every conversation you've had? And it can be very easy to be consumed in this. And this is the devil's strategy, because let me share it like this. Okay, whom you worship also determines the gate you open in life. Because remember, you enter into his gates with thanksgiving and praise. You enter into his courts with praise. But who you worship can open up a gate into your life that you may not like. Because we've all heard that voice. And people come up to me all the time. I've had conversations in the gym and Walmart and different places. And people say, well, I, I, I love watching you online. Or I love to come to the church, but I don't feel worthy to come. Why? Oh, just because of my lifestyle, what I'm doing. I party too much. I'm here and there. I don't feel like I'm worthy. I said, no, no, no. You need to be at church. You need to encounter the presence of God because God is going to meet you exactly where you are. But I realized for so many of us, you start to worship. God can do it. And you hear in, the, in your ears, Satan just giving you lies. No, he can't. You're a cheater. You're a liar. You're a thief. You're an addict. You hear all these things that make you feel unworthy to praise the name of the Lord. And so because of that, you keep quiet. And I realize for some of us, we're so stressed out on the inside and we're so condemned, we don't even know how to worship the Lord and how to feel his freedom. This is the enemy's strategy from the very beginning. When sin entered into the world, what did Adam and Eve do? They hid from what? From the presence of the Lord. Genesis 3, 3 verse 8. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And Satan's strategy is to convince you to hide from God. Why? So the sin stays in your life. That's why. There's a sin in your life that you haven't confessed, that you haven't given over to the Lord, that you're too embarrassed to talk about, and you're holding on to it. And instead of shouting praise to the Lord, God, redeem me, restore me, forgive me, make me new. Instead, you're holding it in, and you keep it with you even when you leave the church. Worship frees you. When you come in here, and you may be guilty and ashamed. You still can praise the name of the Lord and repent. And in that moment, he redeems you. And he makes you brand new. And you leave this place new, fully free. There's power in worship. In Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 14. 
O oh Lord, if you heal me, I will be truly healed. If you save me, I will be truly saved. My praises are for you alone. Do you believe what you sing? Do you believe the words that come out of your mouth when you praise God? God, thank you, Father, for saving me, for restoring me, for redeeming me. And then we leave here and we still just look at the same conflict in our life and we feel like we're in bondage. You came in here and you praise the name of the Lord, but you go out there and you speak negativity in every situation that you have. And I get it. It's frustrating and it can be hard. But that's what you're speaking over your life. So here's what I want to do. Here's what I'm excited to show you guys today. I want to show you three revelations that I believe can change your mind and open your eyes about the power of worship and what worship could do in your prayer life and how you can receive a word from God that can change who you are to your very core, okay? So the first point is this. We talked about this a little bit. I'm gonna show you something different though. Sing his praise, okay? First point, sing his praise. You were created in the image of God to sing praises to his holy name. Psalm 57, verse nine and 10. I will thank you, Lord, among all the people. I will sing your praises among the nations, for your unfailing love is as high as the heavens, and your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. So when you come into the presence of the Lord, sing praises. And you may be saying, but pastor, you don't want me singing. Right? My family doesn't want me singing. I don't want to go around my house singing because that's going to be torture for everybody. And your spouse may say, yeah, that's true. Don't let them sing, please. But listen, here's where it gets good. It's deeper than how you sound or just you singing. Listen to me, please. When you proclaim the goodness of God and you speak it out loud and you praise his holy name, you change the atmosphere of your home. Don't miss this. You change the atmosphere that is in your house, okay? How you feel in the moment, what is taking place in your home. Have you ever gone home or just had one of those weeks where there's like a heaviness and you don't know why? You come home, everybody's bickering at each other, everybody's aggravated, nobody wants to talk to each other, or maybe you came home from a busy day like, hi, everybody, everybody's like, stop talking to me, like, what did I do, right? And everybody's just annoyed and frustrated. You need to understand, it is a spiritual warfare taking place around us. And the world is constantly trying to consume your mind and your heart to open up a gate into your home a door into your home. And so a lot of times we feel this depression, this darkness, and it's heavy on us, yet we're just speaking more negativity. Well, I don't know what's wrong with them. Something's wrong with them. I don't like them. That's your spouse. Okay, well, I'll pray for them. <laughs> let me get somebody in trouble today. But let me show you this. Okay, Second Chronicles chapter 5. This is really cool to me. Solomon had the elders and leaders of Israel bring the Ark of the Covenant into the temple of God. Okay, so he's instructing them how to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the temple of God. And the, the scripture tells us that these musicians got together who were Levites. And they started playing music to worship the Lord. All of a sudden, listen, not only does the atmosphere change spiritually, it changes physically. And they actually physically see with their eyes the presence of the Lord in the temple of God. 2 Chronicles chapter 5, 13 and 14. The trumpeteers and the singers performed together in unison to praise and give thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments, they raised their voices and praised the Lord with these words. They shouted, he is good. His faithful love endures forever. And at that moment, don't miss this, a thick cloud filled the temple of the Lord. And the priest could not continue the service because of the cloud. The presence of God was so thick in that place because they prepared a space and had their hearts ready for the Lord. They were joyful in what God was doing. The Ark of the Covenant was in the temple, that they were in the presence of God. And it became so consumed with the presence of the Lord that they had to stop preaching. They had to stop. Because the presence of God, listen to this, for the glorious presence of the Lord filled the temple of God. Didn't need a fog machine. Didn't need any of that. Didn't need lights. None of that. The presence of God did it all. Why? 
because their hearts were ready to receive. That makes a huge difference. Trust me. There may be days you walk in here and you just don't feel it because your heart is not ready to receive what God wants to speak to you. And it's by worship that we change our perspective and be able to get ready. Because I want you to think about this too. Since we were young, we have been groomed by our culture to sing nothing but worldly praises. In every song, we literally, we, we sing songs praising breaks up, breakups and getting drunk. We sing songs praising going out and going clubbing and going to the bar. We sing praises of relationships and hooking up. We have these things in our head that we don't even know we're singing them. And we wonder why our house or our home feels so dark. And we don't even understand the things that we're speaking over our life and our house. But I'm telling you today, when you feel that darkness, praise the Lord. The atmosphere will change. And God will drive out those demons. God would change everything. And I want to share this story because this, I was reminded of this. Um, a while back, my wife was coming downstairs from putting Gabriella to bed. And she was almost in tears and said, listen, this happened in Gabriella's room. And um, she said she was putting her to bed. She was praying and she was singing worship songs. And all of a sudden she said, listen, I started to hear what sounded like a choir of angels singing in Gabriella's room. And she said that she could not stop. She just wanted to continue to, to sing and sing and sing because she just kept hearing these voices so clearly. And it was like the presence of God was so strong. And I wondered why she was up there for like two hours putting Gabriella to bed, <laughs> right? But she came down and she gets the presence of God was so strong. We don't always see. We don't always know what God is doing. But when your hearts are ready and you prepare the space, the atmosphere changes. Home life can change like that if you praise the Lord and worship him and prepare to listen. And this brings me to my second point. Listen to this, all right? We sing praises to the Lord. The second point is this, we sing to battle. We sing praises to God to fight because again, this is a spiritual war. Ephesians chapter six, verse 12. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. And one of the best examples of this is found out of 1 Samuel chapter 16. And in this passage of scripture, we see that the presence of the Lord has left King Saul. He's been disobedient. He's done his own thing. And so now the Bible is telling us instead of the presence of God being upon him, instead of this anointing that was upon him, he's now being tormented by these demons he's allowed into his life. And so they start to talk, well, we need to give him some help. We need to calm him down. So they talk about bringing somebody in to play a harp, to bring in music. And guess who that musician was? David. And when David came in there to play worship music, the demon had to leave. Let me share it with you. First Samuel. 16, 14 through 16. Now the spirit of the Lord had left Saul and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that had filled him with what? Don't miss that. With depression and fear. That was the tormenting spirit. Some of you have the same spirit attacking you every day. Listen, it could be sent out. Some of Saul's servants said to him, a tormenting spirit from God is troubling you. Let us find a good musician to play a harp. And whenever the tormenting spirit troubles you, he will play soothing music and you will soon be well again. And in verse 23, it states this, and whenever the tormenting spirit from God troubled Saul, David would play the harp. Then Saul would feel better and the tormenting spirit would go away. So don't miss this. This is very powerful. We sing praises to the Lord to battle. Okay, the spiritual forces that are around us. Not only will God change the atmosphere, but he sends out the demons that want to attack you with uh, depression, anxiety, and fear, and all these things that weigh you down. And God wants to set you free from that. But also don't miss this, because even though Saul saw relief, his heart was not yearning for the Lord. He became obsessed with jealousy and pride. And he began to hate David 
He began to hate David because the presence of the Lord was upon him. And something happened. Saul tries to attack David. And then all of a sudden we get this revelation about the enemy. All right, listen to this. 1 Samuel 18 through 12. The very next day, a tormenting spirit from God overwhelmed Saul. And he began to rave in his house like a madman. David was playing the harp as he did each day, but Saul had his spear in his hand and he suddenly hurled it at David, intending to pin him to the wall. But David escaped him twice. All right, don't miss this part. You ready? For Saul was afraid of David. Saul was afraid of David for the Lord was with David and had turned away from Saul. Saul was afraid of David because the presence of God that used to be on him was now on David, okay? But listen to this, because a demon was tormenting Saul, that demon was scared of the presence of God. That's really what's happening here. So look with spiritual eyes here. The demon that is tormenting Saul is scared of the presence of the Lord. Meaning when the presence of God is on you, the devil cannot touch you because he's afraid of you. Not because of your own strength, but because of the presence of God, the goodness of God, this hedge of protection that we even see out of the book of Job. Okay, This is upon us when we dwell in the presence of God. And it changes everything. Clears your mind. Changes your house. It's just how you live, how you think. There's another story I want to share with you. Um, I remember at a time, a friend had called me, and he explained to me that his grandmother was experiencing some things in her house. It just seemed dark. Um, there was a weird presence that was there. Some things had been happening that she was seeing, and he just wondered, hey, would you come over to the house and just pray over the house? I said, sure, fine. So I come over to the house. I start praying, and then I felt so strongly that I needed to worship the Lord. So in every room that I would go into, to overcome the subject of what, why I was there, I would start praising God. God, thank you so much, Jesus, for being here. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for you are so good. Holy, holy, holy is the name of the Lord. Holy is your presence. Nobody compares to you. Nobody is as strong as you. Nobody can stand up to you, Lord. And as I praise the Lord, the atmosphere completely changed. And the darkness started to leave. And what's crazy is after that experience, he called me later and said she never experienced anything again. By doing what? By worshiping the Lord. Your heart ready and prepared to receive. God wants to speak to you. And not just on Sundays. God wants to speak to you every day. Some of you come here on a Sunday and God just wrecks you and you're like, man, this is amazing. Do you realize God will do that every day if you allow it? But you have to make time for it. So in your quiet time, when you're trying to hear from the Lord, are you worshiping? Are you preparing your heart to receive? Or do you feel dry? Because unfortunately, a lot of us as believers just feel completely dry and disconnected from the presence of God. And so my last point is this. We sing to not run dry in the spirit. We sing praises to the Lord. And we remind ourselves, even when it's hard and difficult, that God is in our situation and that he is good. And here's what I love. Jesus gave this revelation about worship that he had never said before. But he gave this to this, the most unlikely person he could possibly give this advice to. And he spoke this to a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. What's interesting about that is that if you know the Jewish culture, the Jews did not associate with Samaritans because of their idols. They would not be caught talking to a Samaritan. Yet Jesus is here at a well, Jacob's well, talking to the Samaritan woman. Now, another thing to know about the context of the scripture is that she came later in the day by herself. The Samaritan women would come early in the morning. So as they drew water from the well, they would have conversations. So not only was she an outcast in the Jewish culture, this proves to us that she was an outcast in her own culture because she didn't want to be around anybody else. She wanted to hide. So when she came to draw water from the well, here's Jesus sitting there and she can't believe that he's talking to her. And then he starts to talk about her life. I love this. Because he knows exactly what she's doing. 
And he tells her straight up, you've been with many men. In fact, the guy you're living with right now, is not your husband. But Jesus did not condemn her. He didn't shoo her away. What did he do? He revealed a revelation to her to draw her near. And it changed her life forever. And he shared two important truths about worship that I do not want you to miss today. The first thing he said was this. In John chapter four, verse 10 and 11, he said, if you only knew the gift that God has for you and who you were speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. Now, if you keep reading the story, she didn't understand what that meant. How can you give me this living water? How can I never go thirsty again? That well is deep. What kind of water can you offer to me? But don't miss the words of Jesus. Meeting this woman directly in her lifestyle of sin, he met her exactly where she was. And he said, do not miss the gift that sits before you. The gift that I have for you, the salvation, this living water, you will never go thirsty again. And I'm telling you today, that may be you right now. How many times do we come on a Sunday just because it's church and we miss the gift? We miss it all. We don't really worship, we just stand here. That was good, that was okay. It could be better, I liked it. We receive a word, that was good. We go eat, we do our own thing. But you have to prepare your heart. You have to get your mind ready to hear from the Lord. And I believe it's when you close your eyes and you hear his words, don't miss the gift that is before you. You're thirsty for a lot of things. You have needs in your life that are real. But you're going after the wrong dreams. And you're chasing everything else to satisfy, satisfy the needs that you have and they're not doing the job. And there's something tormenting you, but instead of bringing it to the Lord because you don't think you're worthy to praise his holy name, you're going more towards the sin in your life and it's just condemning you more and more and more. And you find yourself completely dry and so thirsty, yet you don't know how to quench the thirst. And Jesus is saying, don't miss the gift. For the living water represents the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God living inside of you. Let me also say this. Jesus said this. John 4, 23 and 24. He told her, but the time is coming. And indeed it is here now. When true worshipers will worship the Father in what? In spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him in that way. Why? Because God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And the beauty about this story is that Jesus is pretty much stating all of us have a well on the inside that should be flowing with living water. And when it's flowing with living water, we can't help but to praise his holy name. It comes out of us. We just want to shout and give glory to him what he's going to do. The hope that we have, it should be pouring out. But some of us are completely dry. And we have nothing on the inside. his gift we missed his presence we're busy with life we're trying to do everything else and we're not being full with what he wants to give you and Jesus stated to the Pharisees in Matthew 12 34 he said for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks and when you feel dry on the inside you have no words and it's difficult but I love what Jesus said out of John chapter 7, verse 37 and 38. Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds. He said, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And when he said living water, listen to me, he was speaking of the Spirit. How does God want you to worship today? by the Spirit and His truth. The Holy Spirit flowing out of you. Let me ask you this real question. Do you feel dry? Why? 
if you feel distant from the Lord, why? What was your quiet time like this week? For many of us, we didn't have one. And I'm telling you, God wants to wreck you every day, but it's when we worship. And we sing these praises. supposed to have surgery, not need the surgery anymore. I've seen marriages restored that everybody thought they were too far gone. I've seen people hate each other and when they worshiped in the same place. There was forgiveness and there was love. I've seen those who feel so far from God, so devastated and hurt break down in tears because God showed up exactly where they were and they changed their life and what I love about this Samaritan woman is that she couldn't hide what the Lord had taught her this woman who used to hide and get water by herself because she didn't want to have a conversation immediately went back into the town to tell everybody who Jesus was. And you can experience that too. And worship is the start of it all. Hey guys, this is Pastor Bobby Chandler and I just want to say thank you so much for watching today's message. We pray that it blessed your life, but do me a favor before you just click off of YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our channel and also ring that bell so that you get notifications on the next sermon or any announcements that we have going on. I also want to say thank you for being a faithful partner with Authentic Church because of your giving, we are able to bless and impact the people around us every single week. So we love our Authentic family and thank you today for joining us.